Um, thanks everyone for coming. It, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce this week's seminar speaker, who's Brandy Krell's to Dubai. Sorry, I'm still working on that. Um, who uh, we are fortunate to have working as a postdoc on our integrated biology project. Um, and so Brandy comes to us from Duke University, uh, where she was working, <laughs> where she was working with Dr. Kathleen Donahue, and um, she'll be telling you about all of that cool research today. So I won't scoop any of it. It's a fascinating story and brings together, I think, many of the things folks in this room think about whether they think about plants or not, about seasonal timing and demography and fitness in a changing climate. Um, and uh, before that, uh, she got her Bachelor's of Science um, at the University of Virginia, where she did an honors thesis with um, Dr. Debbie Roach um, on evidence for multiple aging phenotypes in Plantago lanceolata in response to neighbor and seasonal stress. So Brandy has kind of a wide ranging um, skill and knowledge set in ecology and evolution. And she's been applying this to thinking about how plants are responding to changing environments. And I'll let her tell you more about that. Jenny. Um, yeah, as Jenny said, I'm gonna be telling you about my dissertation work at Duke today, investigating the demographic consequences of dispersal through space and time. So I think a lot of us know climate change is affecting the environment. Two ways that were important for my system were changes in temperature and precipitation, especially in the eastern United States. Um, so this um, group of authors show changes in temperature here on the left, where orange or red places are getting warmer, blue places are getting cooler. Um, they show changes in precipitation here on the right, where brown places are getting drier, and some of these dark blue places are getting wetter. Another change that we're seeing is that there's the potential of change in spring snowpack. I think everyone here is familiar with that, where with warmer climate, we may get lower snowpack, which can then affect season length depending on the species. Another way that climate change is affecting the environment is, through, is by changing seasonality. Um, so instead of our seasons being very cleanly outlined, um, we may have kind of bleeding into each other where our falls are getting warmer, our winters are getting warmer. Uh, which can all affect plants. So ways that plants can respond to these changes is by tracking the environment, whether spatially through seed dispersal or through time, phenologically tracking um, changes in seasons. Another way that humans are affecting the environment is through habitat fragmentation, right? So whether that's deforestation or urbanization, and sometimes this can result in metapopulation dynamics. And what I'm really talking about here is just patch dynamics. So um, over here, I'm showing you an environment where the only ha suitable habitat are these circles. Um, the filled in colors are habitats that are occupied. Empty, empty circles are ones that are not occupied. So it's that patch occupancy dynamics. Um, and then dispersal is going to influence the amount of colonization that's going to happen between these patches um, here. And so if we have this big barrier of dispersal, we may see that there is differentiation on either side of that barrier, where plants on one side start to look more similar to each other than on the other side of that barrier. And all of this um, can affect the strength of demographic stochasticity, stochasticity and genetic drift. We have a lot of patches that are extinct, um, or they're just really small population sizes because they're not getting as much dispersal. We may see um, really strong demographic stochasticity at play. So usually when we think about habitat fragmentation, we think about at this really large scale, right? But it can also happen at a small scale too. Um, so over here, I'm showing you like a field with some gopher holes. Um, here's, you know, a nature trail is kind of splitting up the grass on either side. Um, and so this can be really relevant for plants because limited dispersal is common. And so we may have like a much smaller situation where, you know, what I showed you before, but very similar dynamics of catch um, dispersal and extinction and colonization happening. So for my research, I was curious what factors determine spatial dispersal ability? What are the consequences of spatial dispersal and population demography? And what are the consequences of temporal dispersal on population demography? Um, first, I want to tell you about what species I was working with for this. I worked with Rabidopsis taliana. 
Um, it's an annual plant, which makes it um, great for doing quick field experiments. Uh, it has a plethora of genetic resources, which I took advantage of, you'll see in part three. Um, and it has variation in seed dormancy across the native range, as well as its wind dispersed. Um, so all those were really helpful for asking these questions about spatial and temporal dispersal. And you know, one bonus is that there was a naturalized population in North Carolina, um, close to my field site. Um, something else you need to know about Arabidopsis is that it has a typical winter annual life cycle. Um, and so they like to germinate in the fall, kind of grow as a small rosette over winter, grow really fast in the early spring, and reproduce in late spring. Um, and this is partially because they really cannot handle hot, dry summers. And so one problem you see is that they drop their seeds at the beginning of summer. And so there has to be something that tells that seed to wait. And that's kind of a foreshadowing of seed dormancy, which I'll get to in part three. Okay, so what factors determine spatial dispersal ability? Back to these figures I showed you before of the changing environment, the same um, group of authors looked at changes in shifts in tree species. And so these arrows over here are just the shift and the mean abundance of various tree species in Eastern United States. Don't worry about the colors in the, on the map, that's just different eco provinces. What I want you to see is that whether they're shifting west or east or north or south, they're kind of going to this area on the map where it's getting cooler and wetter. So they're kind of tracking these changes in the environment. So what's going to affect how fast their plants are able to track that change? Um, the quantity of dispersers and the characteristics of good dispersers are two things that can affect that rate. So the quantity of dispersers is going to affect population size, which will affect extinction probability at the population level, the crop yields available to disperse, and post-dispersal density um, is going to affect the, region, the levels of competition happening after dispersal. So if we start it with a source population that has, we'll, we'll call this high density population. If after dispersal, very few individuals disperse to a new environment and we end up with a small population in our new dispersal area, then we're likely to get extinction just from demographic stochasticity or genetic drift over time. Um, for who is dispersing, that's gonna affect the future spread rate potentially. So we have source with population where now we have big plants and little plants and we get biased dispersal. So a non-random subset of that group. So just the big plants are dispersing to a new environment. Something about being big means that you're better at dispersing. So now we have a bunch of big individuals in our new dispersal front. We can get spatial sorting because now we have all good dispersers at the edge and they're gonna keep dispersing, uh, which can lead to faster spread rate. Well, this actually depends on whether or not those traits that are correlated to dispersal are genetically based or if they're plastic. So if they're genetically based, if the environment in our dispersal front changes, then we might expect those traits to remain the same and we still get spatial sorting. If there's plasticity and for some reason in this new environment, all the plants just grow really small, and we no longer have that trait that's gonna increase dispersal. And so now we're getting slower spread and we're not gonna get that spatial sorting. So what environments do we expect to differ across a range or even within a small dispersal area? Um, so if we consider this the center of a range, we might end the circles here. The size is the density of the population and the color is gonna represent season length with red representing a longer season and blue representing a cooler season. As we disperse out, um, just from reduction, each time we disperse, we're gonna get fewer plants likely. So we're expecting that density might decline across that dispersal front. Um, and then if we're going up elevation or latitude, then season length may also decrease as you go. And so I want to re remind you that this life cycle is already very limited, right? So they're already kind of stuck with this period of fall to late spring. So if we shorten our seasons even further, that can be really detrimental. Okay, so for this part, my specific questions were how many individuals disperse different distances, what traits are associated with dispersal ability in the field, and then do those traits show plasticity to density and season length, and then do good dispersers differ from poor dispersers in their response to the environment. So to answer the first two questions of how many individuals are dispersing and what are the traits that they have, 
I set up seed traps in the field um, and my, I had sorceries that are made up of uh, many different ecotypes from across the range of Arabidopsis. And I put some seed traps, these are just trays with soil, um, either close distances, about 0.3 meters away from a source, kind of this middle distance, about one meter away, um, and then this farther distance, uh, which is about a little bit less than two meters away from a source. I let the wind do its job of dispersing the seeds. And I brought those trays into the greenhouse and just counted how many things germinated and measured their traits. So what we saw here first, uh, showing you the dispersal kernel, which is density on the Y, and distance in meters on the X, there's very limited dispersal. Uh, you see this drops off pretty rapidly, uh, even really before you get to two meters. Um, and then if you wanna see this in a different way, this is both dispersal density across distance. And so you can see that the far dispersal trays had a lower post dispersal density than the close trays and then as well as the sources. So density dispersal is limited in this species. Okay, so for the traits, um, just to give you an idea of what I was measuring here, I measured rosette leaf number and leaf size, whether of a given single leaf or across the entire rosette. I measured the height of the main flowering stalk, the number of branches directly off that stalk, number of basal branches from the rosette, and the number of healthy and mature sleeks, which would be sleeks that fully matured their seeds. Those are fruits for the species. And the average seed weight of the seeds that it produced. So for this, I found that you're gonna see um, figures that have the trait on the y-axis and dispersal trait distance on the x. For leaf number, you can see that the fire dispersal trays had more leaves than uh, the plants in both in middle distances. See a marginally similar effect for leaf length, where the fire dispersal trays had slightly longer leaves than the other two distances. And we also see that the fire dispersal, plants and fire dispersal trays produced fewer basal branches than the other two distances. So more leaves, bigger leaves, and fewer basal branches um, is contributing to dispersal in this species. Well, those are the only three traits that were associated with dispersal. All the other traits that I measured, um, which you can see here on the bottom, did not show any differences across distance, really. Um, the only one that had something weird going on was the number of healthy fruits. I can tell you a little bit more about what I think about that after the talk if you think when it's curious. Okay. So that was the part about figuring out who's dispersing, how many are dispersing. Um, due to limitations to that experiment, I had to then go get separate plants from those same source trays and get six good dispersal genotypes based off those traits I had found in the previous study and six poor dispersal genotypes. So those are being smaller plants. And then I grew them in high density and low density. I did this with my undergraduate assistant, Xavier Hildeberg. And then um, high density plants had six other plants growing around them in a two inch pot. And then in low density, it was just one plant per pot. And we were able to measure size of reproduction at the beginning of the reproductive season. And then we simulated a short and long season by measuring reproductive traits five weeks after they had their winter chilling or 11 to 12 weeks after that chilling. Okay, so the results for this are gonna look like reaction norms. Um, and so if, there's a genetic basis only to a dispersal related trait. We would see that the purple, which are good dispersers, and the teal, which are poor dispersers, would separate here along the y axis only. And so it would have the same response across environments, but have different traits. If uh, those traits are plastic, like based off plasticity only, then we would see that there's no difference between the lines um, you know, separating, but they are showing a change from environment one to environment two. If there's a genetic basis and plasticity, we might see separation between those lines and a change between environments. And then lastly, really complicated case would be if we saw a genotype by environment interaction where those two different types of dispersers um, show different slopes from environment one to environment two. Okay, so what did we actually see? Um, we saw that dispersal related traits have a genetic basis. So you can see this for leaf number and that our two lines did separate. So they're, different traits um, at both low and high density. And we saw the same effect for rosette diameter and basal branch number as well, all of our other dispersion related traits. 
Uh, we also saw plasticity. So all the traits decreased from low to high density. So for, again, for leaf number here, now we can see the slope is going, you have higher leaf number and low density and lower and high density. And same uh, result for the other two traits as well. Okay, we also saw a G by E interaction here as well, which um, you can see in that basal branch number now. Um, and especially in a short season, the good dispersers had low basal branch number across densities, whereas the poor dispersers did show a, a significant, de did show a decline from low to high density. This is not statistically significant, but the G by E that was statistically significant is when in mature fruit number, which is the same effect in the short season the good dispersers have low fruit production, regardless of density. Um, and then the poor dispersers have slightly higher uh, fruit production and low density and then decline in high density. Okay, and then as a reminder, we expect lower densities and shorter seasons with dispersal towards the range edge. So in that scenario, if we start with a high density source and ran a long season, you're gonna to get to a lower, lower density edge and still have bias dispersal. And then because those plants at um, low densities are still able to have more, more leaves and fewer basal branches, we may still see plant spatial sorting happening, um, at least better than the poor dispersers. Of course, of course, they're not making a lot of fruits in general, so that's a problem. And the short seasons, uh, just low total crop yield production may counteract the effects of that spatial sorting where even though we are still having the good dispersers are maintaining their traits, um, but they're not producing a lot of fruits, so we're just not going to be able to do that fast of a dispersal. So a takeaway from this part is that plasticity alters predictions of spatial sorting, and therefore the speed of environmental tracking at range edges. Um, and it's really important to consider this. Um, a lot of papers are, are talking about spatial sorting right now. And I think plasticity needs to be thought of within that conversation. Okay, part two, what are the consequences of spatial dispersal? So now we know who's dispersing, how many of them are dispersing, what's the effect of that on, on individual populations? So what I did for this part, well, first I'll tell you some background. Um, so how important is spatial dispersal for population persistence in the face of habitat fragmentation? So the consistency of dispersal is going to affect um, potentially population size and fluctuations in population size. So if you're constantly sharing seeds with the neighboring patch, um, you may be getting help with just the number of individuals in that patch. Versus if you're isolated, you're not getting as much help. And so maybe you're just having more drastic changes in population size across years. Um, it's also gonna affect the distribution of variation within and between populations. So populations that are sharing their seeds are more, like, more likely to look like each other um, and to have lower population differentiation Whereas isolated populations, there's going to be more variation probably between populations. And lastly, this can all affect the strength of genetic drift. So if we have a smaller population size in an isolated population, and it's uh, having maybe potentially lower genetic variation within the population, then we may have stronger drift. So for this is just, what are the demographic consequences of dispersal? My setup for this, I had open populations that are, are basically the source populations from part one. And then I had closed populations where I put these cages around them to prevent any incoming immigration. So it's still some space around the tray to make sure that I'm not affecting the environment too much. And so seeds can still get out of that tray, but they can't grow because we've got some shade clock down. Um, and so all of these started with the same mix of ecotypes. So there's a good amount of genetic variation to start with. I had six caged populations and 12 open. Okay, so for the data collection for this, I measured or counted population size at three different times, uh, pre-winter, early winter, and early spring, because um, those are kind of critical times for this species. And so I, that allowed me to get population level uh, measures of survival for early winter and late winter survival. And then I also measured a bunch of traits on the reproductive plants. Okay, so for population size here on the Y axis, uh, here the colors are to be open are in orange or yellow and the closed populations are this kind of black gray line. And then I separated each year 
And then within each year, it's pre-winter, early winter, and early springtime point. What you'll see in year one is that there are really no differences uh, in population size between the two treatments, which is kind of good because we started with the same seed mix. Um, but then after year two, so now that we've had you know, a round of dispersal occur in the field, uh, we can see that um, we get this population crash in year two for the open populations. Um, but those populations start to recover throughout the year. So they have kind of higher survival throughout the year which allows them to kind of catch up to the closed populations by the end of year three. Um, and so while they crashed, they kind of came back, the closed populations just kind of continue to decline um, from year two to year three. This is supported by our survival results. So here, this is showing you a proportion of early winter survival and this is at the population level. You can see that in year two and year three, um, year two is marginal, but the open populations had higher early winter survival than the closed populations. So even though they had this initial like lower germination potentially, they're able to survive better throughout the year. Uh, we can also see this at the individual level. I had help from an undergrad only in year two, but we were able to see uh, the same effect at the individual level for survival in early winter. Um, same effects for late winter population level, um, open had higher survival, and then same thing at the individual level. So whether whatever time of the year we're looking at, the open populations, they're somehow able to have higher survival. Then there's the question of population differentiation. So the distribution of variation. And so this is a distribution of variation in leaf number. And so the gray colors are going to be variance within a tray, and blue colors are variance between trays. So in the open populations, 100% of the variation in leaf number was within trees. Um, whereas in closed populations, there is a, about 20% of the variation is between trees. So we are getting some differentiation between the isolated populations. And we still have the same effect for all the other, most of the other traits that we measured. So early buds, early flowers, early fruits, leaf length, primary branches, and then fruit number. Uh, we had two exceptions to the rule where basal branches, there's just not a lot of variation in that trait. Um, and the Durham, North Carolina environment isn't great for this plant, so they just made one basal branch most of the time. Um, and then height, the results kind of flipped where we had more population differentiation in height for the open than the closed. Um, that, not quite sure why that's happening, but I have some ideas if people are curious later. Okay, so takeaways from this part. If you have populations that are open to dispersal, um, and so sharing seeds, they may have slower rates of population decline um, than populations that are isolated from each other, and they have less between population variation. I have some genetic data from this, so I'm going to hopefully see if these uh, translate it into lower amounts of genetic variation in the isolated populations as well, or if it's just population differentiation that we're seeing. Okay, so evidence, there's evidence for metapopulation dynamics or this patch dynamic going on here, even at a very small scale. Okay, so now we're gonna get, we're switching gears from thinking about spatial dispersal to thinking about temporal dispersal. Okay, so phenological tracking is when plants use environmental cues to control the timing of developmental events. Uh, we often think of this in terms of flowering time for plants. So with fruit trees, for example, we are often thinking about how fruit trees need a certain amount of winter chilling in order to get their flowering timing right in the spring. But germination time is also really important. So uh, germination has, is gonna set up the timing for the seasonal environment for the rest of the plant's life. Um, it hasn't been studied as much and that's likely because it's really hard to distinguish little tiny seedlings from different species in the field and just to get out there at the right time to count these seedlings. Um, but another key factor here is that seedling mortality is high in many species. So uh, this is a very important life stage for plants. And so um, all seeds need the right amount of water, oxygen, and temperature to germinate. Um, but seeds, what dormancy can do is add additional requirements to that. So seasonal dormancy is what's kind of allowing this plant to do this winter in the life cycle, telling those seeds to wait out the summer until the fall to germinate. There's also a form of a different form of dormancy called between year dormancy, where that seed just like stays in the soil for multiple years and doesn't germinate for across years. Uh, for this talk, I'm going to focus on seasonal dormancy. 
Okay, so what's the what's the big deal here? So what happens if you are you don't have phenological tracking? Um, if you're in a non-dormant population, and so you germinate in the summer as soon as the seeds hit the ground, uh, you're likely to just to have complete population like wipe out. So no no individuals survive to reproduction because um, it's just too dry and too hot, and then you just have extinction, which is bad. <laughs> A possibility number two for having a non-dormant population is that maybe they find just like they get lucky, they get a nice pocket of summer that has just about just enough rain. Uh, it's maybe slightly cooler, and so they get um, a few individuals survive to reproduction, but maybe not a lot. But because they do get those individuals, they're able to maybe have two generations within a year because the seeds that these individuals make can germinate in the fall at the right timing and make a reproductive population in the following year. Well, as if you're a dormant population, you don't get a choice. You only get one generation per year. But because you're growing in the right time of year, maybe you're having a larger reproductive population and you're getting likely persistence because of that. Um, another thing to consider here is what about uh, um, just across environments? And so if you're in an environment where it's just really wet or really dry all year long despite season, then phenological tracking might not help you maybe get escape that environmental pressure. But if you're still having some seasonality within that environment, maybe finding the better season in a really terrible environment helps mitigate some of those effects of a terrible place to live. So my questions for this part are, what are the demographic consequences of dormancy, with respect to population size, survival, and population persistence? I set up here, I had three dormancy treatments, dormant, mixed, and non-dormant, which I'll tell you about in a second. And I also had four environmental treatments, uh, control high humidity, native soil, and litter, and eight replicate populations per treatment. And in here, for this experiment, I completely took out spatial dispersal as an option. So every single population had a cage around it so that everything happening in here had to happen from the seeds that I originally planted and the seeds that those plants made each year. Okay, so to create my dormancy treatments, I used recombinant and red lines that were created by previous um, researchers. Um, so just an example of how that happened. Um, there's one of my populations is Italy, Sweden. And so they took some plants from Italy where dormancy is favored because it's really hot and so it's better to wait out in summer. And they took some plants from Sweden where it's really cold. And so if you wait too late, the ground is frozen. So it's better to be non-dormant in that environment. Um, they crossed those two plants. They did a bunch of rounds of crossing and selfing to the point where they got these genetically variable recombinant and red lines at the end. And then they did QTL studies on those lines to find loci that are associated with seed dormancy. And so I chose two to three of those loci that had the strongest effect on seed dormancy, which allowed uh, me to get um, something like this. So this is the frequency of the Italy wheel, sort of the more dormant population. And at the two loci that I chose here, I have a hundred percent of the Italy allele at those two sites for the dormant population and zero percent of that allele, so 100 percent of the Swedish allele at those two sites for the non-dormant population. And then I put all those dormant lines and all those non-dormant lines in the same place so that I get 50 percent of um, 50 percent of the, both of those alleles at that site. And then because these are recombinant and red lines, the rest of the genome, I have allele frequencies of around 50 percent, which is really great. Uh, and then last step I did here was I performed crosses within the dormant and non-dormant lines just to kind of create some segregation and heterozygosity because Arabidopsis is a heavily selfing species. So I just wanted to introduce some more variation there. So for my environmental treatments, I had a control treatment where I just buried greenhouse soil in the field. I had a native soil treatment, which is the native North Carolina clay, um, a high humidity treatment, which were these cages that we're supposed to keep rain out and end up kind of trapping rain and creating a hot, moist environment. And then a litter treatment, um, which kind of created a cool, dry environment. I only have time to tell you about the control treatment today, but there are really inter interesting results of the other treatments. So if you're curious, ask me some questions later. Okay, so the data collection for this was fairly simple. It just bi weekly counts of all these life stages, except for seeds, because I can't see those. Um, and I measured individual reproductive output. And so by doing those weekly counts, by weekly counts, I was able to calculate two week seedling survival. So if you're a seedling, you just germinated, two weeks later, did you survive as a seedling or you changed into a rosette? 
I did survival to rosette, which is just the total number of rosettes in a population at the end of the year divided by the total number of seedlings I accounted. And same thing for survival to reproduction, the total number of rosettes that changed into reproductive plants. Okay, getting to results here. This is seedling population size on the y-axis. Um, dormant populations are in orange, mixed are in green, and purple are non-dormant. Um, you can see that by year three, dormant populations had higher seedling population sizes than the non-dormant populations. Um, and you can see the mixed populations kind of followed that trend as well by year three, and they had higher population sizes as well. Um, and you can kind of see this develop over time, where it's not significant in year two, but you can see that that's kind of becoming a trend. For seedling survivals or two big seedling establishment, which again is just number of new seedlings that are either establishing or, or dying. Um, this was measured at different times. So this is summer, early autumn, and late autumn for year one and year two. You can see that in year one, early autumn, the only significant result here is that the mixed populations had higher seedling survival than non-dormant, but the dormant populations do have the same trend where they're tending to have higher um, seedling survival than non-dormant. It's just not statistically significant, unfortunately. Um, in year two, survival was just pretty terrible. Um, in most treatments, uh, except for the few lucky plants that germinated in early and late autumn had pretty good survival. Okay, what about the other um, life stages? So survival to rosette, I'm not showing this here, but also survival to reproduction and average number of fruits did not differ across treatments. Um, so there's no results, no significant differences between the treatments here. Does this translate into any differences in population persistence? Um, so for this, I'm going to be showing you proportion of populations on the y-axis here. Um, so this is out of the eight, eight dormant populations I planted, or eight mixed dormant, eight, you know, for each replication. And then um, the warm colors are going to be failing in some way. So as you get into the later years, you see there's many different ways you can fail over time. But for year one, it's pretty simple. Either you didn't germinate or you germinated and you died. Um, and then the green populations are gonna be everything that established and persisted. And so you can see the dormant populations had higher persistence than the non-dormant in year one. Same thing in year two. Again, there's more warm colors here, but don't worry about that. Just see that the green is higher uh, in the dormant than the non-dormant. And then for year three, there's a little caveat here. So because survival was pretty terrible in year two, I got a little nervous. And so after everything germinated in year three, I brought it into the greenhouse because I needed DNA and all this other, um, I needed other traits measured for other studies. And so I only have whether or not you germinated in year three. Um, and so this is going to be persistent or reappeared. And so of course, dormant have higher persistence because they had been persisting the previous two years and then they germinated again in year three. Um, but you can see that we had some reappearance in the non-dormant population. So that means that those populations had gone extinct in a previous year. So there was no seeds produced, but there were still seeds that are germinating in year three. So that means between year dormancy was still happening in that treatment, which is kind of interesting because that means that the loci that I chose for seed dormancy were primarily for seasonal dormancy and not between year dormancy. Another interesting thing here is that the mixed populations are mostly doing the same thing as the dormant populations, which might be a sign that um, dormancy evolved in that treatment. Okay, so summarize these results. Um, dormancy increased seedling population size in year three, it increased seedling establishment, um, it increased population persistence, and so that means those early life effects of dormancy are really important. If you just get enough um, initial survival, enough things to germinate initially, then maybe you'll be able to do better as survival just kind of takes the rest of the year. And then mixed populations resemble dormant populations by year three, suggesting that um, dormancy evolved. So takeaways from this part, populations with individuals with, with high dormancy may have higher probabilities of success. Um, so caveat here is especially under favorable conditions. So in some of my treatments, I didn't see differences across the dormancy treatments. Um, and dormancy may not be able to overcome the effects of unfavorable non-seasonal conditions. Um, something that I'm really interested in is whether or not that more consistent above ground populations of the dormant ones may lead to selection or increased opportunity for selection of other traits. So maybe if the dormant ones are consistently doing this winter annual life cycle and they're maintaining these um, populations consistently over time, maybe they have also kind of chilling tolerance better than non-dormant populations. 
Um, last piece here, which I thought this audience might be interested in, is I'm working on putting this, all these vital rates together into a demographic model, um, which will allow me to ask, will dormant populations have higher projected population growth than non-dormant ones over a longer period of time? Does the presence of a seed bank affect that a population growth? Um, so I didn't show you, but I also have a seed bank um, side of the project here. And does the presence of a seed bank affect the difference in, uh, seed in, in, in lambda between dormancy treatments? So we saw that non dormant populations still were able to have a seed bank. Um, does that, would that allow them to recover potentially later? Um, and then is um, lambda or population growth primarily sensitive to early life vital rates to do a sensitivity analysis? So overall, um, all this research suggests that expectations for speed of environmental tracking change when we consider a variation in the environment. Um, and so we're thinking about even on the local scale or range expansion, um, the change in environment, whether traits are genetically based or plastic, or plastic is really important. Um, spatial dispersal can detectively influence population demography even at small scales. And so if we're ignoring that, space, that really small scales um, spatial structure and populations, we might be missing some demographic dynamics. And then finally, temporal dispersal or seed dormancy can facilitate post-dispersal population success, uh, but depending on the environmental conditions. So to understand plant performance in the face of anthropogenic environmental changes, we need to consider both spatial and temporal dispersal. That I, this wouldn't have all been possible without a bunch of undergrad help doing these very large field experiments, as well as a bunch of um, faculty that helped me at Duke University, as well as my funding search sources. And I take any questions. Yeah. Hey, that was a super great talk. Um, I was just curious about. The earlier on point when you were talking about how number of seeds impacts dispersal ability, do you have any like theories of why? And also, have you guys considered like removing leaves to see if the dispersal ability of that individual goes down? Yeah, so uh, that's something I'm really, I was really curious to actually do more heavy manipulations of leaf number. Um, unfortunately, when I brought all those plants into the greenhouse to measure those traits, um, there was some kind of weird pesticide thing that happened and all my fruits kind of curled up and it, none of those plants made any viable seeds. So I couldn't keep looking at that. Um, but one theory, I, I mean, yeah, so my theory was originally that more leaves, usually in this plant, means that it has more to put into reproductive output and so it was going to make more seeds. But the fruit number um, estimates got so messed up there by that weird um, structure that happened. So I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, I do know that in other studies with the same exact plants, I did find a correlation between um, leaf size or leaf number and fruit output. So that could be the key there. If you're just making more seeds, then those, then you're just going to disperse better um, potentially. Thank you. Yes. Wonderful thought. Um, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on the uh, next steps for evolution of the things and populations. Yeah. Seems like you've got lots of opportunities. You can track like Swedish versus tell you the fields. Add your list side and other list side. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the first easy step was doing uh, germination assays with these plants. Mm -hmm. So like, I brought all those plants in, we collected the seeds that those plants made from year three. Um, and I also still had my founder seeds left over. So I did a germination assay with founder seeds and the evolved seeds. And we did see that um, in those mixed populations, dormancy did involve. We had um, lower germination proportions and the evolved seeds compared to the founder seeds after like four days. So that suggests that's the first sign or second sign after the field results. Um, yeah, and then we also have a bunch of DNA and we collected leaf tissue from those. And so yeah, the really easy step is just go back to those, those loci that previous studies looked at and see if we see changes um, in the fr frequencies there. Yes. Yeah, in the first part on, on dispersal, uh, trays from different distances. It seemed like as the you know as you're sort of dispersal curls declining, you're still pretty high numbers of plants, right? Like it was like 400 per meter square or something like that. So I'm I'm curious, like I mean, not that you're going to do an experiment where you put out trays over like kilometers and stuff like that, but like what do you think that that um, at, at what stage does dispersal sort of become limiting uh, to a population? That like you're still getting 400 per meter square, that seems like a lot of 
plants. I know they're small, but yeah. like there's also other plants out there. So at what point does, you know, yeah, what size, you know, what distance does dispersal start to actually be limiting? Yeah, I think, um, so, in, so I guess, so that's like per meter squared. So in my trees itself, like my far distance, I was getting like 20 plants. Um, that's of course, I'm only getting a portion of that whole area. Um, so if we had like a situation where there's like only certain patches within that per meter square that are suitable, then maybe even that two meters distance might be really limiting. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think it would be closer to maybe 10 meters or something like that in this species. Um, but yeah, I'll have to go back and double check what my dispersal kernel is looking like. Yeah. You talked a little bit about like dormancy and climate changes like changing in the mean, but I was curious, another dimension of climate change is like change in variability. And mm -hmm. could you talk about how you imagine dormancy kind of interacting with that in your system? Yeah. Yeah. So if we're thinking like changing in variability, like between years, but like this year, maybe it's a warmer year, next year it's a cooler year. Um, if our seasons are still kind of roughly in shape, then, then seed dormancy might be able to kind of help mitigate that um, variation across time. Um, if there is, yeah, it's, if there's more variation within a year, that gets a little bit trickier, right? So if like, that means maybe some years we're gonna get like an earlier frost than others, then in that case, having that um, later germination might not be that beneficial. So is there a lot of variation in the, the dispersal kernel for the multi-generational ones, meaning the first generation has a very different dispersal kernel than the second generation? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. I only did it for, I only had that experiment for one year out in yeah. the field, but yeah, you could definitely imagine that that would change across years. Especially. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't phrase it right. I mean, just for the non-dormant ones, oh. right, because you have two generations per year, mm -hmm. you could imagine that the first generation has a very different dispersal kernel than the second one because the environmental conditions are different. Plants maybe are, I don't know, smaller or whatever, have traits that would make them disperse less. And I was wondering to what extent is there evidence for that or not? Yeah, so actually that is something I'm, I'm really interested in is the kind of relationship between this, the seed dormancy and the, and the seed dispersal. I wasn't able to get to that um, for this, but yeah, you could definitely see a case where if they're um, germinating the first time in the summer and they may be just smaller because they can't get as big and they have lower dispersal, but if in that second generation they're able to disperse better. Yeah, this is a really interesting idea. Yeah, but I, yeah, I don't think there's been too much um, research into that exactly yet. I, I found it surprising that height was not one of the traits that you found important to be a good disperser. I think that's also been found in other Arapanasas studies. Can you just comment maybe on what you think might be going on? Is that is that specific to your study or, or you know, are different traits important for dispersal in different yeah. conditions? Yeah, I, I was confused by that too. Um, so there was a previous study actually done by Kathleen, my advisor. Um, that they did inside with like a wind tunnel. And in that experiment, they did find an association with height. Um, I don't know if it's just because I'm not, I was out in the field and so the conditions were different out there. And maybe um, being taller actually meant that you're like gonna be you know bumping into the other plants more. And so like, you're gonna be, yeah, I just, I'm really not sure about that. But something to do with like some being outside now and also interacting with the other plants around you. And especially given they were in high density, there could have been some kind of interaction there. Yes. So following on Jenny's question, when you looked at the um, traits, you kind of did them individually in relation to dispersal, but almost surely they're collinear. Did you look at if there were combinations of traits together mm -hmm. that led to more dispersal? Yeah, that's something that I ended up not, I don't think I did it for this yet, but it's something that I am, it's on my list of things to do before I publish that, that chapter. Um, yeah, because we, we were able to look at for the second round of that when we were just growing the plants in high low density, um, there definitely were like kind of groups of traits that were co-occurring together. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be really cool to, to see it, if that kind of followed in with the previous experiment as well. Because I noticed height was like in the right direction. Even yeah, was. yeah. So that is something to, yeah, it is usually positively correlated with these other ones, especially in that second experiment where we were just growing the plants in the, in the greenhouse. We did see that height was correlated with having more leaves um, and having fewer basal branches. So yeah, it's just maybe, yeah, it's a good thing. I'll definitely look into that.
Oh, that's good. <laughs> 